Hello mind mappers and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be going over The Practicing Stoic by Ward Farnsworth. Now if you're looking for a little bit of insight as to what the ancient Stoics would have thought about happiness, keeping up with the Joneses, and overcoming adversity, this book is going to be perfect for you. I think that Ward's done an amazing job at distilling some of the most potent information coming from the ancient Stoics and showing us how we can use it in our everyday life. That's really what this book is all about. After all, it's called The Practicing Stoic. The first point that I pulled out of the book that I think encapsulates what we're going to learn from Ward today goes like this. The body of ideas known as Stoicism contains some of the finest and most durable wisdom of any age. The Stoics were deep students of fear, status, emotion, and much else that bedeviled the human race thousands of years ago and bedevils it still today. They were philosophers and of a down-to-earth sort, seeking by force of their insights to free ordinary people from their sufferings and illusions. Free ordinary people from their sufferings and illusions. Interesting. The Stoics had their limitations, of course. They held some beliefs that, were very, that very few people do anymore. But in other ways, they were far ahead of their times. They said a number of the best things that anyone ever has powerful statement. The teachers of the Stoics, the teachings of the Stoics, are as interesting and valuable now as when first written, maybe more so, since the passage of two millennia has confirmed so much of what they said. The idiocies, the miseries, and other discouragements of our era tend to seem novel or modern. Hearing them described in classical dialogue reminds us that they are nothing new, that itself was a claim of the Stoics, that stories and problems of humanity don't change, but they just put on new masks. The same can be said for the remedies, the most productive advice anyone offers nowadays, casually or in a bestseller, often amounts to a restatement of something the Stoics said with more economy, intelligence, and wit a long time ago. The reader does better by going straight to the sages. And I believe that this is probably the most potent statement, the most potent couple of paragraphs as to why I'm so infatuated and interested by the Stoic philosophies. I'm noticing more and more how much the Stoics actually knew before their time. And how many ideas really end up lasting for a few millennia? Not very many of them. Especially not very many that seem to get more and more important as society gets more and more technologically advanced, so to speak. Stoic philosophy has come somewhat of a passion of mine, specifically for this reason. The philosophy has been true since I was born and likely will remain true for millennia to come. One of the cool things about learning from people who have studied Stoicism as deeply as Ward has is that they are able to show us how it's applicable to modern life. Sometimes when we try to read the ancient Stoics, they were dealing with, as he said, problems with a different mask on. And Ward really allows us to see the problems for what they are. Ward is the dean of the University of Texas Law School. His thoughts, observations, and meditations on Stoicism in this book are, in my opinion, very logical and I feel extremely applicable. On this channel, we've learned from some of the best modern-day Stoic teachers, Donald Robertson, Massimo Pellucci, Ryan Holiday, William B. Irvine. I believe that Ward is a welcome addition to that list, and I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Perfect for an aspiring Stoic practitioner and experienced Stoics alike. With that, we're going to get directly into our mind map. You can see here that I've highlighted two gold points. These are what I believe to be the most important points coming out of the book, The Practicing Stoic. And if you want to get the most out of these mind maps, you can do that by following along. Find the process of how I mind map, plus 50 plus mind map templates, including this one, all at the link down below. Following along with the mind maps is going to help you learn more, remember better, and apply these books to your life. And with that, we're moving into... Point number one, first principle. The first principle of practical stoicism is this. We don't react to events. We react to our judgments about them. And the judgments are up to us. We will see the Stoics developed that idea in the pages to come. But this expression of it is typical. If any 
external thing causes you distress, it is not the thing itself that troubles you, but your own judgment about it. In this, you have power to eliminate uh, the power to eliminate right now. That's from Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. The Stoic claim, in other words, is that our pleasures, griefs, desires, and fears all involve three stages rather than two. Not just an event and a reaction, but an event and a judgment or opinion about it, and then a reaction to the judgment or the opinion. Our task is to notice the middle step, to understand its frequent irrationality, and to control it through the patient use of reason. This chapter starts with noticing. Later chapters will talk about irrationality and offer advice about control, but we're going to talk about noticing in this first principle. We begin here because the point is foundational. Most of the rest of what the Stoics say depends on it. Soon we will hear from them about externals, desires, virtues, and much else. But it all begins with the idea that we construct our experience of the world through our own beliefs, our opinions, and thinking about it, in a word, through our judgments. And those judgments are up to us. And what I want to invite you to do is to think about the last time that you felt pleasure, grief, desire, or fear. Bring that episode up in your mind and ask yourself these three questions. What were you reacting to? What were your judgments about that scenario? And how were your judgments causing that reaction to be skewed? Now, this is incredibly common. So common that it's likely happening to you every single day. The way you react to things is so much based on your perception of that thing that you wouldn't even believe it. For example, if you fail in a business venture, some might see that as a reason to stop. Others might see that as a reason to adapt and change. What changed in that scenario? The person's judgment is the only thing that changed. The way they saw the potential business failure the way they saw the breakup that they suffered, the way they saw the book that they read or the information they took in, it's all about the perception of the actual object or the perception of the scenario. Let's look at our ability to change these judgments in real time through a case study of one of my coaching clients. Recently on a coaching call with one of my clients, they presented me with a large list of problems, and this is quite often. He was stuck in his day job and didn't have enough energy to do anything after work. He didn't have any skills that he could use to get another job or to start a business or something like that. Everything he had tried in the past didn't work out or felt like it was too much work and not worth the reward. As an experienced entrepreneur, I know these feelings. I've felt all of these feelings before and I've overcome these feelings. So here's what we did. We wrote down a list of 10 ideas. How could he overcome his time constraints? What are 10 ideas? What skills does he have or how could he easily learn? 10 ideas. What did he fall, uh, how, why did he fail in the past and how could this time be different? 10 ideas. So what's the secret here? One of these ideas was the idea perhaps, was that why? I wrote down 10 ideas or we wrote down 40 different ideas potentially or 30 different ideas and one of those ideas was going to be the thing that got him out of this rut of only seeing all of the problems that he had. Was that the thing? No. But what we were able to do with all of these lists of 10 ideas was to shift his perspective, change his judgments about the scenario that he was in, see how much opportunity he had rather than all of the objects in the way. This allowed him to view the problem from a solution-focused perspective rather than a defeated perspective. And once again, this is going on in every waking moment of our lives. We are constantly viewing uh, interactions with people. We're constantly viewing things that are going on in our businesses or things that we're reading or taking in. We're viewing them in one way, and we tend to think that that's the way they are. But if we can get into the practice, if we can get into the first principle and using the first principle of questioning our judgments, questioning our assumptions, and perhaps even turning them on our head, we would be well served to do so. Our next point is about don't be happy. Stoics regard virtue as sufficient to produce happiness on all occasions, and also as necessary for it. 
the happiness centrally valued by the Stoic is eudaimonia, or well-being, the good life rather than the good mood. Here comes eudaimonia again, something we've talked about a lot on this channel. But the Stoic believes that virtue gives rise to joy and to peace of mind as well. Virtue produces these good consequences as side effects. The primary mission of the Stoics, in other words, is to be helpful to others and serve the greater good. And they don't do this to make themselves happy. They do it because it is the right and natural way to live. But doing it in that spirit, as it turns out, makes them happy. So, I think this is very interesting. The point uh, that we're trying to make here is not necessarily that you need to serve people because that is going to be what makes you happy. But you want to serve people, serve the greater good, for the greater good, for those other people. And as a byproduct, that tends to make us very happy. So what's the secret to happiness? Well, don't try to be happy. This is something that stuck out to me, something I'm resolving to practice more often. Instead of focusing things like uh, the money that I have in the bank, the leisure time that I have, and the happiness producing things that I have going on in my life, I am focusing deeply on the people that I help. That's what this YouTube channel is all about. Crafting myself into the type of person that can help you. A person who can contribute to you at the highest level possible. And what does that look like for you? What might that look like in your everyday life? What are you focusing on right now? Are you focusing on yourself and your wants? Or are you focusing on other people and how you can help and provide value to them in a real way? And another quick side note here that I didn't write down, but why are you focusing on other people? Are you focusing on other people because you're really trying to use that as a way to make yourself happy? Or are you doing it because you know that that's what leads to eudaimonia? You know that serving other people at a very high level with a lot of value is what's going to lead to eudaimonia, the good life. I suggest doing a quick inventory right now. First, you might want to imagine yourself as someone that you can help. What skills do you have? What energy can you commit? Where should you be focusing right now? Quick side note, this is a great time to actually download the mind map and follow along with these exercises. You can pause the video as you go through. Second, I want you to imagine who you might be able to help. Who are they specifically? What do they need help with? Where can you find those people? And then of course, third is the action phase. Take notice of how you feel when pursuing the betterment of others rather than the betterment of yourself. Quick note, this is why to me all entrepreneurs who are customer focused, number one most important thing to very successful entrepreneurs I've noticed from the ones that I've talked to is that they're obsessed with their customers and not with the money in their bank, the number of employees they have, how big their company is. In other words, they're not obsessed with themselves and their status. They are obsessed with the product and service and the ability to help the customers that they have. After helping a certain amount of people, eventually the money just ends up coming to you. That's why I believe that entrepreneurship is really a, a great stoic activity. It's really something that you can do. You can provide a lot of value for other people. You can live uh, up to the good life. You can live up to stoic virtues while also being rewarded for those. Our next point is deviate. And again, this is our second gold point, the one that I believe that you should be paying the most attention to in this mind map. The first rule of this branch of Stoic learning, teaching, is contempt for conformity, for the opinion of the majority, for the habit of looking to others when thinking about what to do how to, uh, and how to act. The problem runs deep. A large share of what the most people say, think, and do is a product of convention. Its force is hard to resist because getting in line with what others expect causes them to think well of us. Deviating from it tends to be punished swiftly by others who are more comfortable saying, doing, and enforcing what is expected. Much of Stoicism is the effort to see the truth and act on it, and to learn a noble contempt for the consequences that follow. Wow, much of Stoicism is the effort to see the truth and act on it, and to learn a noble contempt 
for the consequences that follow. Doing something indifferent is extremely hard for many reasons. This is the keeping up with the Joneses cliche that we've heard so many different times. Not the least of which is definitely the madness of the crowd. Keeping up with the Joneses and and conforming is not something that I really felt until I was in my late 20s. I don't know if that's normal or if other people have experienced that, but before I was in my late 20s, I had always run businesses, driven crappy cars, and lived frugally to foster my own freedom. But something happened in my late 20s, and I'm not sure I can even put my finger on it. I wanted to fit in. I wanted a nice house, a fancy car, and the modern things that other people have. Who could blame me, I guess? All of the marketing that's pointed towards us is those things. So where are you conforming? I wonder, is it taking away from your freedom and your pursuit of your true calling? It's a personal question. There's nothing wrong with nice houses, cars, or anything else for that matter. But what is wrong is doing it because everyone else is doing it, not because you truly want those things. And this is exactly what happened to me. I don't actually care about nice houses, cars, or status, or anything like that. But this did end up happening to me. I started conforming, not because I valued these things, but because it was easier. Happy to say that I realized it midstream. I was actually kind of confused, and I'm very happy that I came across some stoic teachings because it really pointed it out to me. And I was able to double down, back away, and keep pursuing my true calling, which again, is helping people helping other people reach eudaimonia for themselves, and hopefully along the way, I can pick up some for myself. Our next point is about attachment. What is the difference between a preferred indifferent and the desire that the Stoics regard as hazardous? Detachment. An attachment to an external cause uh, causes one's happiness and equilibrium to depend upon it. The Stoic tries to avoid that position under all circumstances, But money, if held without attachment, is unobjectionable. For the money isn't the problem. The point is the health of the mind. The word detachment risks creating the wrong impression, since it can connote a lack of real interest in whatever is the subject of it. That isn't the idea. Detachment refers more to the way in which something is held and to whether the mind has been given over to it in an excessive way. The detachment of the Stoics thus can be viewed as a kind of moderation, that is. Moderation in one's relationship to externals. A good way to test such a relationship and to know whether you have an attachment to a thing or just a preference about it is to consider how well you would handle the loss. This is something that Stoics do quite a lot. How well would you handle the loss? So what does your happiness depend on? That's really the question that we're getting at here in this point. Let's take a look. Do you need these things to be happy? Do you need success in your career or status? Do you need material goods like clothes or cars? Relationships or partners or friends and friendships? Do you need those things in order to be happy? How then would a Stoic instruct us to look at these things if we decided that we didn't need them to be happy? They would instruct us to practice detachment to these things. Instead of focusing on the outcomes, they would show us that focusing on living with virtue leads to a longer and sustainable happiness. And that a healthy sense of detachment is going to actually allow us to focus more on the things that we truly, truly enjoy, the things that we truly find virtuous and and valuable. So practicing detachment. What would it look like if you lost all the things right now that you have attached to your happiness? Your career, your success, your house, all the things that you have strived so hard for, that we've all strived so hard for, your business, whatever it might be. How would it feel if you lost all those things right now? Really get into it. Dive into that feeling. Look more into that feeling. It's a great exercise to try. Once you feel that, How can you go on allowing those objects, situations, and people to control your happiness? Because now you're not fighting to be yourself. You're fighting to keep up with your needs, your external needs. I think this is a very interesting and nuanced point. I would love to spend a long time going over just that point on attachment. 
I think it's very, very important, something that's come up quite a lot in modern society. And perhaps I will do that one day. But for now, we're going to move on to adversity. Stoics avoid, avoid adversity in the ways that anyone would, anyone of sense would. But sometimes it comes regardless. And then the Stoic goal is to see adversity rightly and not let one's peace of mind be destroyed by its arrival. Indeed, the aim of the Stoic is something more, to accept reversal without shock and make it the grist for the creation of greater things. Wow, to accept reversal without shock and to make it the grist of the creation of greater things. Essentially what that's saying is to take failures and turn them around and use them to your advantage. Nobody wants hardship in any particular case, but it is a necessary element in the formation of worthy people and worthy achievements. That, in the long run, we definitely do want. Stoics seek the value in whatever happens. I thought that that sentence was very interesting. He essentially is saying here that Things that are worthy are sometimes hard, and quite often we know that to be true. Living up to your virtues and your ideals is very, very difficult sometimes. It necessitates you to focus for long periods of time and necessitates you to study things that are complex and difficult. You might have to take risks, delay satisfaction, or choose a more difficult path for yourself than others might. So you can see all of these things are, of course, difficult. They are the grist mill that he was talking about before. As Ward points out here, the Stoics don't view adversity as something to seek out necessarily, but they do view it as something that might happen along your path to living the good life. So what should we do then when we come up against adversity? We should do our very best to see it as clearly, unemotionally, and logically as possible. In my experience, quite a lot of adversity is actually created in our mind through our judgments and perceptions that we talked about before. Almost everything worthwhile in my own life required me to face some sort of adversity. Building a business is hard. Studying and understanding the human condition, which I'm trying to do right now, is complex and difficult. Relationships and finding the right person to be with can be extremely difficult. But I wouldn't be who I am today if I hadn't gone through each of these adversities. I wasn't looking for adversity when I found it, but meeting the challenge was definitely worth it in the end. I came out better on the other side. I think that's a great way to think about adversity, and I want to thank Ward for giving me some really great brain tidbits to help remember when I am going through adversity. That was The Practicing Stoic by Ward Farnsworth. I want to thank you for being with me here today, and I hope to see you in the next video.